Good morning. Welcome to today's Jefferson County Unified Command Joint News Conference. Representatives from Unified Command who will be speaking today include Mark Wilson, Jefferson County Health Officer, Sarah Nafziger, Emergency Physician and Co-Chair of UAB's Emergency Management Committee, Tony Patelis, Jefferson County Manager, Randall Woodfin, Mayor of the City of Birmingham, and James Coker, Director of Jefferson County Emergency Management Agency. Each speaker will come forward and give some brief remarks on specific topics that they would like the public to be informed of and aware of as we transition to Governor Kay Ivey's Safer at Home order, which went into effect at 5 p.m. yesterday and expires on Friday, May the 15th at 5 p.m. I would like to mention that everyone here is practicing social distancing and wearing masks. Masks will be removed by each of our speakers prior to stepping up to the podium. After all five speakers have given their remarks, we will open the floor up to questions from the media. With that, we will begin the briefing with Mark Wilson, Jefferson County Health Officer. Good morning. I'm encouraged by the progress that we're making in our community. While Alabama has not fully met the benchmarks recommended by the White House before lifting the stay-at-home orders, the new statewide safer-at-home order does represent a careful approach. I think everyone should be proud of the process that went into the final decision. A tremendous amount of input from various interest groups across the state was considered. As people may know already, the main changes from before are, number one, retail businesses can open at half of the normal allowable occupancy, while social distancing requirements and proper cleaning practice from the CDC must still be followed. The other category is that dental, medical, and surgical procedures can proceed unless the state health officer determines that those procedures would greatly reduce the access to personal protective equipment or PPE. We will be carefully watching the supply and demand, and the challenge is for our health department, we need PPE to conduct the testing related to the contact tracing, and we do have a limited supply. The plan to watch this new level uh, until May 15th is wise to make sure we don't see an increase in the rate of COVID-19 cases before we take the next step. Our unified command will continue efforts to promote the safety of our community as we enter this new phase of safer at home. The Jefferson County Department's um, Environmental Health Division has stepped up its capacity to assure that businesses are following the guidelines to keep employees and customers safe. Public health partners are continuing to increase access to community testing, including access for people without health insurance or the ability to pay. To make sure that our testing efforts are well coordinated and guided by data and the best expertise available to us, we are forming a countywide testing collaborative to guide and coordinate the COVID-19 testing efforts going forward. There was a test site in Central Park yesterday, and there's one in Center Point this afternoon at the Cathedral of Cross site. And I'm pleased to announce uh, some next week that are coming up, appointment only drive-through mobile testing sites uh, next week. On Wednesday, May 6th, there will be testing at Western Health Center in Midfield. And on Friday, May 8th, at East Lake United Methodist Church in Birmingham. There are also plans being made for another test site in the Bush Hills area. These are by appointment only. The number is 205-975-2819. Additionally, the Jefferson County Department of Health is continuing to build up the staffing capacity that's needed to conduct and increase the contact tracing and individual quarantine that will be required. Contact tracing is where we know we have a person with COVID-19. 
We then track down all that person's contacts, make sure they're quarantined and tested if need be. We're working on a data-driven strategy for community testing, as well as the increased contact tracing that will be required over the next several months. The collaborative that I just mentioned will include three groups. Number one, a small group of infectious disease, epidemiology, and public health experts that I'm assembling. Number two, a group representing the various providers of community testing. And number three, a group of representatives from each of our five county commission districts in Jefferson County. There'll be two representatives from each of those and they have already been chosen by our commissioners. This will ensure that we have some level of community input, assistance in choosing and supporting the test sites, and communication with our political leaders and the public about the testing strategy. Widespread accessing, I'm sorry, widespread access to testing is important, but I want to caution individuals to be very careful about placing too much confidence in test results as they make personal decisions. Getting a negative test does not rule out the possibility you could be infectious a few days later. There's also a lot of interest in the antibody tests that people have been hearing about and some are being offered by various providers, but we do still have concerns about how to properly use these and we don't want these tests to be used to give people a false sense of security. Regardless of how fast or how slow business activity and other activities increase, everyone needs to continue to do everything they can to protect themselves and others from infection. Minimize travel outside the home, wear a face covering when around people from other households, wash your hands frequently with soap or hand sanitizer, especially after touching frequently used items or surfaces. Refrain from touching your face until your hands are washed or sanitized. Cover your sneezes or coughs with a tissue or the inside of your elbow and disinfect frequently used items and surfaces often. People who are more vulnerable to the complications of COVID-19 should continue to be especially careful and stay at home if at all possible. Remember, COVID-19 can be spread by people who have no symptoms, so everyone should act as if they or others around them may be infected. Don't be lulled into a false sense of security everyone is going to have to get used to this new way of life for several months to come. Finally, I would like to share with you some data that we're now able to share about the racial breakdown of COVID-19 in our population in Jefferson County. We have finally received the expert statistical analysis documentation that we required in order to meet the HIPAA compliance. So, deaths by race thus far, we have of the black population, um, or, or of those deaths, 40% are black, 58% are white, and there's 2% that are other or unspecified. That compares to our population of, excuse me, Have to get to that. Let me proceed. I'm sorry. Our, our population is 42% black um, and 53% white. So again, those deaths are 40% black, 58% white, and 2% other or unspecified. The positives about race, positive tests for COVID-19, 45% black. 45% white, and 10% other. We also have a total number of tests done. They're about roughly equal between white and black in Jefferson County. However, there's a large percentage where we do not know the race or it's unspecified because laboratories do not always report to us those demographics. We will be working to share more data um, to you, uh, other demographics at the county level, and we're looking at ways to share more information at a level uh, less than the county, such as zip code or other division, 
but we're, we're going to have to have more statistical analysis in order to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Next will be Sarah Nafziger, emergency physician and co-chair of UAB's Emergency Management Committee. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Wilson, who just spoke, for his courageous leadership through this difficult period uh, in, our, in our city and state and country. Um, he has been a remarkable inspiration to us in the healthcare community, and we'd like to thank him for that. Um, I think that I speak for all of my colleagues who are healthcare workers when I say that we um, are very eager to serve our patients and to expand um, the, the services that we're able to provide under the governor's new Safer at Home orders. Um, we have at UAB Hospital a backlog of essential services that need to be provided to people, and we're prioritizing getting those done as quickly as we possibly can. And uh, in, the, in the same time, we're really trying to turn on elective services so that we can uh, begin to serve our patients and meet the needs that they have. Uh, that exists that we have not been able to meet during the past couple of months due to the coronavirus crisis. As we move forward, uh, let me just say first of all that the safety of our healthcare workers and our patients is our top priority. So we don't want to take that for granted and because of that we're rolling out our expansion of services in a very measured and sequential way. Um, throughout the, the ramp up, what you'll see is that uh, PPE or that personal protective equipment is going to be our rate limiting factor because we want to make sure that not only our healthcare workers are safe, but that our patients are protected also. So as we schedule procedures and schedule appointments, uh, you'll see that that is a consideration. So things won't look like they did before. We won't be able to uh, just quickly turn everything back on uh, just on Monday morning. It's going to be a slow uh, ramp up. When you do come in for uh, your health services, what you're going to see is a lot of emphasis on social distancing, on people staying at least six feet apart, on hand hygiene and environmental cleaning, and on universal masking. Um, UAB Medicine has implemented a universal masking policy that's very similar to the city of Birmingham's ordinance. And uh, all of our staff and faculty and uh, patients and visitors will be asked to wear a mask while they're in our facilities. This is to help prevent the spread of disease. Finally, as we uh, move forward, we are uh, taking some other measures to make sure that it is safe uh, to, to come receive health care services in our facility. We are monitoring new cases, um, not, not just on a daily basis, but on an hour by hour basis to make sure that uh, we know what's going on in our community and so that we can have indications if we need to uh, slow things down. We are testing patients prior to them having procedures done so that we know whether or not they're infected with COVID-19 prior to performing their procedure. The reason for uh, doing this testing is to make sure that we keep our healthcare providers and patients safe and so that we can conserve that personal protective equipment that we talked about being in short supply. We test patients on admission to the hospital as well for the same reasons. And uh, finally, we test our healthcare workers very generously, both when they have symptoms, but also uh, when we need to do so as part of contact tracing epidemiologic investigations. So we're taking these measures to make sure that when we do turn things on and expand our services that we can do so safely. I'd like to remind the public that this personal protective equipment that we wear in healthcare settings, um, that's not just something that we wear for our own protection, uh, but it's also for your protection as well. Uh, as you've heard that uh, from many media sources, there um, is the possibility that a person who has no symptoms of COVID-19 could have the illness and spread it. And so that's part of why we're asking not only our patients and uh, any family member that might accompany them to wear a mask, but we're also having our providers and staff members do the same thing. When you uh, are accessing health care, you'll find that uh, not just at UAB, but um, other hospitals in town, that visitor restrictions are remaining in place. Um, we'd like to ask the public to understand that this is for your protection and for the protection of your family members and for the protection of our health care workers. We have to limit exposures as much as possible, 
And uh, we ask that you understand that uh, these visitor restrictions will remain in place. We will definitely attempt to balance um, that need for protection with families' need for compassionate care visitors and to have a loved one with them during very difficult times. Finally, I'd like to uh, close out my comments by uh, mentioning uh, this, this uh, medication that a lot of you have uh, asked about called remdesivir. Uh, remdesivir is a medication that was developed through the UAB Housed Antiviral Drug Discovery and Development Center that was funded by the National Institutes of Health. And Gilead Pharmaceuticals has a license to develop this drug. UAB has participated in clinical trials with this medication. And uh, you may have heard in the news this week that the analysis shows that this study drug can shorten the amount of time that patients are needed to remain in the hospital by several days. Uh, patients who receive it have less adverse events from the virus. And there's some suggestion that there may be uh, a benefit in mortality, but that data is not complete. So I did want to provide that information for you and let you know that UAB continues to participate in those clinical trials, and I think that you'll hear more about that medication as we move forward, as well as many other medications that are being studied for the treatment of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nafziger. Next up to the podium will be Tony Patelis, Jefferson County Manager. Good morning. I want to say I'm very happy today to announce that the Jefferson County Courthouse uh, is open. We opened the courthouse in downtown Birmingham, Bessemer, and the Center Point Courthouse, along with the Revenue Office in Gardendale and in Hoover. Over the last three weeks, our team has been very, very busy and getting everything ready for the public to come to the courthouse. We've put plastic barriers uh, with, uh, before all the counters. Uh, we have uh, removed seating. We have installed si new signage for social distancing. We have our security officers working the hallways, making sure that we're practicing social distancing. We, uh, we had a lot of folks this morning, uh, and I want to say that uh, some of the people that were in line this morning to renew their April car tags. Those, those renewals have been extended until May 15th. So, but the, the most important thing I wanna stress today is the fact that you don't have to come to the courthouse. We offer several services already online. You can buy, renew your car tag. When you buy a new car, you can do the title online by building permit. Uh, work in probate. There's many things you can do online, and I would recommend that if you have work to do at the courthouse, go to our website, jccal.org, and look at our website in the top page, and you'll see frequently asked questions. And in that, you will see all the services that you can do online or by mail, and I would recommend that you do this. Yesterday, the Supreme Court of Alabama issued a, a ruling to extend the stay until May 15th. If you have anything to do with the circuit court, district court, or family court, contact your attorney. Uh, if you don't have an attorney and still have business in any of those courts, I would recommend that you go to the 10th Judicial Circuit website, jefferson.court.a la.court.gov. At that website, it will have the information that you need if you have to have business in circuit court, district court. I want to say if you're coming to the courthouse, be sure and wear a mask. Uh, everyone that showed up today were wearing masks, and I was very excited about that. And people were practicing social distancing. This is very important to keep you safe and also our employees safe. And also, I want to say to Dr. Wilson, He's done an excellent job under these very trying times uh, as we move forward in Jefferson County. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Next up will be Randall Woodfin, Mayor of the City of Birmingham. Good morning. Let me start by saying thank you to all those participating in the Unit 5 Command and their leadership, which includes um, Jefferson County Health Department, um, emergency management as well as UAB and um, Jefferson County. Um, I do want to also thank uh, Dr. Mark Wilson and the Jefferson County Health Department 
uh, for publicly sharing that information today around um, the stats around where we are as it relates to those who have tested positive and or who have uh, passed away due to the COVID-19. I want to remind people that the city of Birmingham is still under a state of emergency. And there are a couple points um, I need to make. Um, first, um, the actions we've taken has been to send a clear message to people that this is very important. This is what we think is necessary to balance the need to protect public health and get our economy going again and put people back to work. Second, the citizens of Birmingham have been extremely supportive of what we have asked them to do. They understand these steps are not just about protecting themselves, but also about protecting their family, friends, neighbors, fellow coworkers, and others they may come into contact with. Third, these actions are clearly allowed under our law, and we're also using common sense. When it comes to penalties in our law enforcement, they've been very consistent to use this as a way to educate people and not to punish them. We want the message to be clear that we expect people to wear a face cover in public places, but we will also work with them to do, to do the right thing. And I am confident our citizens will continue to do their part. Let me add that in Birmingham, we are working hard to fight the COVID-19. We were the first city in our state to order a shelter in place order, and shortly after the state followed. A few blocks from where I sit at UAB, some of our brightest scientists and researchers are literally developing the vaccine that could solve this problem, not just for Birmingham and Alabama, but for the world. We're busy fighting this virus, protecting our citizens, and getting our people back to work. And as mayor, I am extremely proud of our citizens for what they are doing to help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Woodfin. Next to the podium will be James Coker, director of the Jefferson County Emergency Management Agency. Thank you and good morning. I represent many people who are working in the Jefferson County Unified Command for COVID-19. The Unified Command has been working diligently in order to provide an effective response to COVID-19 within our community. This command structure has brought together various agencies such as the Health Department, City and County Government Departments, medical facilities, response agencies, corrections facilities, places of worship, homelessness advocates, and volunteer groups to work together in a unified structure in order to ensure a strong fight against COVID-19 as a community. Due to social distancing protocols, we've been able to conduct this entire response in a virtual manner, which we've never done before in this county. The first component that activated was a joint information center. This information hub brought together public information officers together from many agencies across the county to ensure consistent messaging and communications across jurisdictional boundaries. You can access the latest information by going to our website, www.jeffcoema.org, and click the COVID-19 buttons on the top of the page. These web pages were put together in partnership with many of the agencies across the county. The Unified Command was tasked from the outset with several problems that needed rapid solutions. One of these tasks was community feeding. In the past week, the Central Alabama Food Bank and the Christian Service Mission have fed over 69,000 families, which amounted to 215,000 pounds of food. As of today, 211 has met all reported needs. If you need help or assistance with acquiring food or other problems, please reach out to 211 so you can obtain the assistance you need. And lastly, the Unified Command will continue to operate until the need ceases to exist. exist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Coker. All right, the line is unmuted now for questions. If you have any questions for James Coker, Please ask them now.
If you don't mind also, before you ask your question, please identify yourself and the news organization that you represent. Dylan. Also, please mute your line. We'll move on to uh, Dr. Mark Wilson, who will come back to the podium. The line has been unmuted. Again, we please ask that if you do not have a question, please keep your lines muted. Thank you. This is Morgan Hightower with WBRC Fox 6. I did have a question for uh, Director Coker, if he could come back to the mic. Um, he was saying that he all the calls to 211 had been met. What other needs were people calling and needing assistance with to that line besides um, a need for food? Okay, some of these may be transportation needs or other needs uh, to take care of their families. So again, we ask that if any of these people have needs, please call 211. They know who to contact to meet the needs. Are there any other questions for Mr. Coker? All right, thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Jim. All right, Dr. Wilson will now return to the podium for questions. Again, if you are not asking a question, please remember to mute your line. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Wilson. It's Miranda Fulmore with WBHM. Um, we had something happen with the audio um, where it kind of went out when you were talking about the uh, countywide testing collaborative uh, to coordinate the testing. Um, and you mentioned three different areas. I think it was something about, you know, a group of infectious disease. Um, can you just restate what you were talking about with that so we make sure we have the correct information? Yeah, sure. This is just um, a collaborative that we're pulling together to make sure everything's well coordinated and that we are, have the guidance that we need. We really want the best minds on this, and we also want to use the data that we have to guide the effort. And there are two components to that. One is the community testing that's going on now, just trying to make sure people have access to testing if they have symptoms and need to be tested. The other is this contact tracing we've been talking about. Uh, making sure that we're able to ramp up our testing efforts for wherever we have a positive case and need to um, I'll pause for a second for that okay yes please I'll, sorry Dr. Wilson yeah in addition to muting your line please do not place the call on hold thank you uh, I was just saying that we we also have to ramp up our efforts to do that contact tracing uh, which is going to involve a whole different testing strategy um, so we just want to make sure we have the best expertise. So, yeah, the three components of the overall collaborative were those experts. Uh, about five or six people we're going to pull together, infectious disease doctors, epidemiologists, and public health experts to just help make sure we're doing it right and that we're thinking about uh, the, the overall strategy. That may or may not include uh, antibody testing at some point. We, that's, that's the type of thing that we need help with. Um, and then the second component of that uh, was just the organizations that are currently doing community testing. Uh, that does include our federally qualified health centers. Uh, and I do want to give a shout out to Christ Health Center uh, in Woodlawn area, as well as Cahaba Medical Care over in West End, uh, who's also done some testing in Bessemer. Um, those guys got out there really early and, and stepped up, and they're serving some of our underserved population. So we're very, very fortunate to have them. Uh, two other federally qualified health centers are coming online uh, as we speak, and that's ARMS uh, in North Birmingham, um, as well as Aletheia House, which is going to assist us with testing some of the um, congregant populations, like our homeless population and some of the folks that are in uh, substance use rehab programs. So. We're really, really fortunate to have a lot of great partners in our community. So we're just making sure that all of those folks are working together, collaborating, just sharing information so we don't uh, duplicate efforts. We're sort of spreading out the access across the map of Jefferson County. And again, making sure that our underserved populations have the same access that the rest of the population has. And then the third area is just to make sure 
that we're in touch with um, the community itself and our political leaders um, um, as we do this strategy, as this testing. Um, and so we've asked each county commissioner to appoint two people that represent their districts um, to help be part of that third group um, just for that communication, also advice if we need it, um, maybe some help in determining where to put a test site if we identify an area that needs testing, say a zip code that has we, we need to target, they might help us find the particular place to put that and also help support that. There wasn't a lot of help for people and it was a good area to go. Located. We're located in Pelham. Okay. We're just off of. Okay. Someone on the line has placed the call on hold. Uh, if you have a question for Dr. Wilson, will you please put it in the chat format here in Zoom? And I will be happy to pass it along to him. Also, after Dr. Wilson speaks, we'll have Mayor Woodfin back up for questions. Uh, so feel free to send those questions as well in the chat if you have them. And. Again, a reminder to please mute your call and do not place it on hold. I will try one more time to unmute and see if we can get questions through that way. Leon or a life experience, so I think it's kind of neat how she got into that. Um, so Are there any questions, any further questions for Dr. Wilson? All right, hold on one moment, Morgan. Okay, I've hey, been, hey, can you hear, are I've, you good, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so we were able to remove the, uh, the line that was on hold. So yes, ask your question, Morgan, thank you. Okay, thank you, Tyler. So Dr. Wilson, can you please just provide a little bit more clarity about the PPE's PPE issue with contact tracing, because my understanding is that a lot of contact tracing can be done remotely by calling folks. So can you explain the importance of, of why you need PPE for, uh, for this, uh, for contact tracing? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Yeah, contact tracing, you're right. That can be done by telephone, uh, just interviewing people uh, or having people communicate with us in other ways. That's uh, again, just tracking down where people have been, how long they've had symptoms, and whom they might have come in contact with. Uh, but then when we identify a contact that might have been exposed, then we have to test that person. Uh, we, we, we immediately put that person in quarantine, uh, and we monitor them for symptoms. Um, and we, if they develop symptoms, that we then need to test them. Uh, we also may have an outbreak in a certain area, such as a nursing home or another congregate living situation, where we have to send people into that setting to test everybody that's possibly been exposed. So it's that testing that's associated with the contact tracing where we have to have the PPE. Okay, and then I have one other question for you. Um, when you were reading out, you said it was 40% uh, black people who have died, the 53% uh, white who have died. And I'm sorry if I don't have this exactly right. I'll listen back to when you said it at the beginning. But um, so we're seeing nationwide and really statewide a disparity with this disease, this virus affecting African Americans more severely than um, white people. Can you explain the disparity on these on the data that you have now is and does it point to us not having enough testing in Jefferson County as the reason why we're seeing the difference um, here versus state and nationwide? Yeah, so um, I, I don't have those numbers in front of me again right now, but basically what the data we have on the deaths so far in Jefferson County is that um, the number of deaths among the African American population or the percentage of deaths is pretty close to the percentage of the population. And for the white population, it's slightly higher, uh, but neither of those may be statistically significant. But basically, we're seeing our death rate so far match the percentage of the population. So we're, we're not quite seeing a disparity right now. Um, you know, our total number right now, I believe, is 46 deaths. So, um, you know, we, we, we will see some variation from just randomness uh, as we go forward. Um, and we also may have an uptick in deaths uh, suddenly uh, that could skew those one way or the other. But 
uh, currently that's where we are. We're not seeing a very big disparity based on race, um, but we are going to continue to track that. And um, you know, I don't know that that's not going to change in the future. But uh, we're 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 very sad about all the deaths, of course. But we're glad that so far we're not seeing a disproportionate um, impact on one race or another. Um, there could be a lot of different explanations for that. There could certainly be some skewing of data uh, because of certain situations. We'll just have to see. And um, but I'm really happy to be able to share that information with the public. And we're going to continue to provide that on uh, our website, which is also being shared with others in our unified command so the public can see that on a daily basis. And, and also, you also asked about the testing. That's another thing that I'd mentioned we're monitoring. Um, and, uh, and the positive versus negative, again, we're seeing, um, in terms of the number of cases, we're not seeing a big racial disparity in Jefferson County. But we're also tracking the number of tests done by race uh, to make sure that that's not just because we're not testing a certain group of people. Because, uh, of course, if we didn't test any people in a certain race, then we would have no cases. So that's just another thing we're following. Um, and there's a, a bit of a problem there because a lot of the labs, when they report their negatives to us, um, they don't give us that demographic information. And if they're negative, we're not going to spend t all of our time just trying to track down the race or demographics on those negatives because it doesn't do us any good. We're going to be focusing on the positives, of course. Um, but of those numbers where we do have uh, demographic information, it's roughly 50-50 between white and black. And of course, in all of these categories, there's an other category, um, either another race or it's unknown to us. Hi, Doc. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Is this Miranda? Hi, yes, it is. Okay. Um, I just have one more quick question for you, Dr. Wilson. Um, can you talk a little bit more, um, if you have the data, about individual numbers of confirmed cases from yesterday's mobile testing unit in Bush Hills? I noticed that you mentioned that um, they were returning next week for more testing in Bush Hills. Is there a reason for that? Did you guys find uh, more cases than you thought you would? Can you just talk a little bit more about that decision? Uh, no, I think there was a little uh, uh, communication glitch. Um, the uh, testing that was done yesterday was in the Central Park uh, area, so um, not too far from Bush Hills, but that was not in Bush Hills. Um, I, I know there were a couple messages that went out that created some confusion about that. So when we go to Bush Hills later on, that will be in a different location. And so, no, we're not going uh, to either of these locations because we've seen increased cases. And I do not have the results from yesterday's testing. Uh, there, there's, um, I just, I simply don't have those yet. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wilson. Are there any other questions for Dr. Wilson before we move along? Rick, this is Sheila Smoot. Can you hear me? Here, sir. Watch out for the cars. Rick. Hello? Are you? Yeah, are you? Are, are, I have one more question. Okay, no more questions for Dr. Wilson. Are there any other questions for Dr. Wilson? Oh yeah, I know. Man, this is not a Wilson. Thank you. Woodfin is coming back up again. Please mute your line if you are not asking a question and do not place the call on hold. Thank you very much. All right, a uh, question for Mayor yeah, Mayor Woodfin. Yeah, this is Sheila Smooth. Um, uh, Mayor, I apologize. I don't know if you addressed this already, so I'm going to start from scratch. Um, the, the contention between you and the Attorney General helped me understand that. Are you guys on the same page now? Um, I'm unaware of any contention. Um, the city of Birmingham will continue to move forward with the ordinances, the two ordinances, which include a curfew that was that is now in effect from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. and a, a different ordinance um, they're requiring the face covers um, if you are out of your home or out of your vehicle with with some exceptions okay okay are there any other questions for mayor Woodford I have one more question for the mayor on that issue. 
you're required Let's talk to about the constitutionality. Does he have an argument there for it not being constitutional and that the city may get hit with a bunch of lawsuits by requiring the face coverage? Does that play into your lawyer? Can you talk to me about that? Do, did its due diligence as it related to um, our lawyers and, our, and the legal process. In addition to that, um, the city of Birmingham is not the only city across America that has done this. There have been many cities and states um, that have done, done this, and um, those recommendations were even made from the executive committee to the actual governor of the state of Alabama. So um, the city of Birmingham has dotted all of its I's and crossed all of its T's as it relates, as it relates to um, the ordinance that the city council passed and supported unanimously. So we will continue to move forward um, to protect the citizens of Birmingham and be sure to stay um, in contact and communication with the health experts um, in our local community who continue to make um, pretty great recommendations to the elected officials here. I have a question. Mayor, oh, Mayor, as well as well as that, you mentioned in your press conference yeah, yesterday. Right. Yeah, you mentioned in your press conference yesterday. I'll be brief. That um, in regard to you said the word this was political uh, about Steve Marshall. Uh, why did you say that? Is that still the case, or because he said some things about your police department, as if you didn't really know what you were doing in regard to running your city? He's swooping down here what? to run your city. I want to know how you feel about that piece because you made that comment yesterday. I think my exact words um, is that this should, uh, this is not political. And in the middle of a health crisis, um, um, this should not be used as a political football. I like to remind people that there are 169 cities across the state of Alabama. And the decisions we are making here in the city of Birmingham um, have not been in isolation of elected officials alone. Um, we continue to get recommendations from our, our local health experts. And I suggested that Steve Marshall or anyone else um, don't listen to me as an elected official. Talk to the health experts and listen to what they say around the importance of face coverings. Are there any other questions from members of the media for Mayor Woodfin? This is Morgan Hightower with Fox 6. Mayor, I know that the council was asking for more complete data about who is getting sick with COVID-19 in Birmingham and who is dying from this disease. What is your reaction to hearing the details Dr. Wilson provided today with the breakdown of who has died and who's been infected in Jefferson County? And uh, is that enough information for y'all? Uh, my first reaction is that I'm very pleased and thankful to Dr. Wilson for publicly providing this information today. Um, I think, um, but my reaction, um, I don't have one yet because I would like to actually look at and be in a position to read the data he shared uh, publicly and, and that information is fresh. Um, what we currently have based on um, what he's shared um, briefly with is that it currently mirrors the county, uh, but that's not necessarily by the 30 plus cities within each county. So there's a long way to go as it relates to delving into the information that's been shared. And hopefully I'll be in a position to provide a, a reaction to you then. Well, I think for a couple reasons. I think if you look at my left hand, um, across the nation, um, you have, that's been shared with us over and over by all the health experts. We know people over the age of 60 are heavily impacted by the COVID-19. We know those with underlying health conditions are heavily impacted by the COVID-19. And we know African Americans are heavily impacted by the COVID-19. When you take the city of Birmingham, one out of five people are over the age of 60. Um, there are a lot of people, um, unfortunately, with a lot of uh, pre-existing and underlying health conditions. And in addition to that, three out of four people are African American. When you take all of that into account, um, knowing that those who test positive have a harder time recovering because of those three, three different things exist in isolation or together, it's important for us to be armed with factual information and that the decisions we make are data driven so we can continue to communicate with the residents of Birmingham the precautions they should take to keep themselves safe. Thank you, Morgan. Are there any other questions for Mayor Woodfin? We have time for one more. Last question for me, Rick. Uh, Mayor, could you just tell the community why it's so important to uh, adhere to your order about this curfew? A lot of people are saying they're going to defy it regardless. You know, we can't check. We've got to accept absolutely. We still have 
You are. Um, as, as, as stated earlier when I first approached um, the podium, I started with saying the following. The city of Birmingham is still under a state of an emergency. I just described to everyone the demographics of our city and, and the possible um, position we can be in where a community spread exists with having such a high population of, of people over the age of 60 who are African American and who have underlying conditions. In addition to that, I think, um, don't take my word for it. Please listen to what Dr. Mark Wilson just said. Please listen to what our friends and those medical experts at UAB continue to say, which is there's still the possibility of not only community spread, but we need to take into account that a lot of people are walking around are asymptomatic to this virus. This virus, make no mistake, is still very active in our community. And when you have a safer at home order that allows us to reopen portions of our economy, which a lot of us want to happen, um, if we haven't guarded against um, adequate testing, adequate tracking, um, data around symptoms and cases, and we still wanted to prevent a run on our hospital, then these are the things we need to set in place to make sure people are protected. And let me say that, for the people that are vocally saying they want to defy this or defy that, uh, not only are they being selfish and reckless, that's just not smart to do, because those can, those can be the same people that are asymptomatic walking around spreading this virus. In addition to that, they can be bringing it back to their own family member or their own coworker. So I think people need to be smart. Um, I think people um, need to remain calm and just follow the ordinances because they're put in place, not about law, not about politics, but from a health perspective to protect you. Thank you very much, Mayor Woodson. We appreciate that. Thank you. Next to the podium for questions will be Tony Patelis. We have time for a couple of questions for him, if you have any. The line is unmuted. Just a reminder to please mute yourself if you do not have a question and make sure that they're, um, do not place the call on hold. Thank you. Of course, we've lost a lot of revenue. Uh, so has all the other governments in, in Jefferson County. Uh, we have 50% uh, uh, of our budget is based, revenues is based on sales tax. And so we know sales tax is down because we've been closed for so long. Uh, we, we are uh, looking at our revenues. Uh, we, we're looking at uh, what we can cut. Uh, we're looking at our capital projects. So we're looking at our budget We've been able to keep people busy. We had a lot of folks working from home. We processed, uh, we, uh, processed over 34,000 renewals uh, online. We did several hundred uh, inspection services online where we, they bought the permits, our inspectors uh, went out. So uh, we've been working behind the scenes, but uh, moving forward, it's gonna be very difficult. And we're putting a financial plan together uh, we'll know more in the next few weeks exactly uh, what our situation is financially. Thank you, Sheila. Are there any other questions from the media for Mr. Patelis? All right. Thank you very much. We Thank appreciate you. it. All right. Finally, at the podium for the final questions today will be UAB's Dr. Sarah Nafziger. If you have any questions for Dr. Nafziger, please feel free to ask them starting now. What's your area of expertise, uh, Ruth, please? Uh, I'm board certified in emergency medicine and EMS, and I serve as the physician advisor to the UAB Center for Patient Flow. I'm the medical director for employee health, and I co-chair our emergency management committee. Are there any other questions on the line for Dr. Napsiger today? Yes, this is Morgan with Fox 6. Doctor, you were mentioning, and, and please uh, expand on this just a little bit, the visitation policy. I might have misheard you, um, but were you saying that soon UAB might be able to allow uh, more visitors in to 
be with patients, especially those who are undergoing complicated type surgery or maybe those who um, have a life-threatening illness, uh, the compassion care. Can you talk a little bit more about when people might be able to visit their loved ones in the hospital? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. So we still have strict visitor limitations in place. Uh, we are not allowing visitors per se, but we have clarified um, some written guidance for our uh, for our staff and faculty to adhere to, to allow for caregivers to be present if that caregiver's presence improves the patient's safety, uh, emotional or physical well-being, and uh, also in compassionate care circumstances such as end-of-life care. Um, th this will be uh, very closely monitored and very limited. So I don't want you to get the message that hey, UAB is opening up and allowing visitors to come in the hospital now. It will be very restricted and handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, however, we do want to balance against the need for people to have a loved one with them when they're undergoing uh, very complex procedures and, and things that could sometimes be dangerous. And we understand that people need a loved one there sometimes, not only for emotional support, but for that physical care as well. So we want to be able to accommodate that uh, in those specific circumstances. In addition, there will be um, some strict visitor restrictions uh, for our ambulatory services as well. I don't know all the exact details around that right now, but you can expect to see some pretty strict uh, visitor restrictions regarding those visits as well, uh, with allowances made on a case-by-case -case basis where it's really necessary for the patient's care. Absolutely. So a couple of months ago, I addressed the media and we, uh, at that time, were looking at a situation where we were seeing an exponential increase in the number of cases uh, at UAB Hospital in Jefferson County in particular. Um, at that time, a lot of restrictions went into place. People uh, began to stay at home. People began to practice social distancing. People began wearing masks. People began really paying attention to good hand hygiene, washing their hands, staying away from one another. Uh, guess what? It worked. Uh, we achieved the thing that we wanted to achieve. Our goal was to flatten the curve, if you will, and to make sure that we prevent the rapid spread of COVID-19 in our community. The data that we have now um, suggests that we, we accomplished that mission, and you, and you know what, I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, in Alabama, of all places, I think uh, people are willing to pull together and to sacrifice to do what needs to be done to meet that mission. So we did it. The problem that we have now is our measure of success is in what didn't happen. What didn't happen is we didn't have our hospitals overrun and overcrowded with patients who have COVID-19. We didn't have people die for lack of ventilators. We didn't have people die because they couldn't get the health care that they needed. That's wonderful. For me, I'm, I'm very comfortable with that outcome and I'm thrilled beyond measure. Um, I, I, like many others who you've heard from today and countless other health care leaders have lost a lot of sleep worrying about that outcome. Moving forward, we have to continue doing the things that we know prevent the rapid spread of COVID-19. We have to continue to socially distance. We have to stay away from one another and not get in each other's faces. We can't cough on one another. We have to wear a mask. We have to wash our hands. We've got to do all these things that we know help prevent the spread of this virus. If, if we don't, we're going to end up right back where we started with exponential spread of disease, and we're going to be facing a situation where we have to look at closing our economy again and look at overwhelming our health care system. None of us want to see that happen. In closing, I, I just want to say one more thing, and I, I think this is really important, uh, it, and it's in regards to masking. You know, a lot of people ask a lot of questions about masks, and I want to make it clear that when we wear a mask uh, out in public, you know, 
it's, it's different for healthcare workers. Sometimes we wear a mask that protects us and has filtration capabilities, that's different. But what I'm talking about is universal masking. When we go to the grocery store, when we go to um, out in public, when we go to get gas in our cars, when we wear a mask, the reason we do that, it's not to protect ourselves from others, it's to prevent us from spreading disease to other people because we could have COVID-19 and have no symptoms whatsoever. So when you put that mask on and wear it out in public, that's an act of love for you, that you show in your neighbor that you care about them more than your own comfort and that you're willing to make that sacrifice to keep them healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nafziger. We appreciate it. A couple of reminders before we conclude today's briefing. Uh, you can continue to help fight COVID-19 by visiting uab.edu slash fight COVID-19. You can continue to track your symptoms there and express support and thanks for the healthcare community. Also, as Dr. Wilson mentioned earlier, the two locations for next week's community testing sites have been confirmed. On Wednesday, May the 6th, it'll be at Western Health Center, 631 Bessemer, Superhighway, Midfield. And on Friday, May the 8th, East Lake United Methodist Church. That address is 7753 First Avenue South, Birmingham. As a reminder, these will be drive-through testing only. Appointments are required, and you should call 205-975-2819. That's 205-975-2819. Thank you very much.